So today we'll be going over bending and the kind of stress that's developed within a beam that's experiencing any external loads. Now let's go back temporarily to our statics course where we actually drew shear, internal shear and moment diagrams of a beam um, experiencing external loads. Let me go ahead and draw an example. Now let's say for this example we have a beam that's experiencing an external uniform load and of course we have the reactions, this reaction here, a hinge, and then we have a roller on the other side. Now going back to statics, right, we went ahead and saw for the reactions, we got the equivalent load, um, equivalent point load of this distributed load, and then we went ahead and drew the internal shear and moment diagram. So let me go ahead and draw these out. So here are the internal shear and moment diagrams that this beam is experiencing with respect to the location from where along the beam what kind of internal shear you're experiencing as well as the moment now when it comes to this we see that that the maximum shear this beam will experience is at either the beginning or the end but when it comes to the moment specifically it actually experience it experiences the maximum moment right where this resultant force of this uniform load is being applied this would be your maximum moment and your maximum shear force due to the external loading it's experiencing now i will go ahead and link the the videos of the drawing the shear and moment diagrams for the beams i'll link it in the description or in this video somewhere as well as solving for the resultant force of distributed loads now once we found those maximum values of the internal shear and moment this is where we essentially stopped but when it comes to strengths of materials this is where we go ahead and use these values such that we're able to design the beam accordingly so it won't fail when it comes to these maximum moments and internal shears that the beam will be experiencing. In this case, we're going to be dealing with the maximum moment and we're going to be using this to design the beam accordingly and see what kind of stress is developed within the beam due to that internal moment. So let me go ahead and draw the beam in reality, right? Um, when it comes to stacks, we assume these beams were rigid. They did not deform, but in reality, they will actually deform a bit. So let me go ahead and draw it out. So in reality, this is how the beam will look. It will actually deform due to that resultant force. Now, when it comes to a beam deforming such as this, one side, in this case, this top side is actually going to be compressed while the bottom side is going to be in tension, right? In this case, let me go ahead and draw, let me go ahead and draw a pie shaped or something a little bit more exaggerated so you could see why the top portion is compressing, why the bottom portion is in tension when it comes to a bending moment. So now you see here kind of like a, a small slice of a pie, right? If you could draw it out the entire circle, I went ahead and took a slice here. And then I went ahead and drew this geometric shape. Now this geometric shape essentially resembles this beam. Of course, I am exaggerating the dimensions a bit, so, you, so it could be a little bit more intuitive. Right, so this top portion, the second the beam actually bends, this top length actually has to be smaller than the bottom portion, right? And we know when it comes to this beam being stationary without having any external loads, it's actually going to be this beam shape, this rectangular um, shape and not deformed at all. So that means the top and bottom lengths are actually going to be equivalent. However, the second it deforms, it resembles this shape. Now, the bottom length actually extends or increases in length while the top length actually shortens. And because one of the lengths is being shortened, that means it's being compressed while the other end is actually being stretched or is in tension. And this gives you a better idea of why the top portion experiences this compression stress and the bottom portion experiences this tensile stress. So let me go ahead and draw the stress distribution along the cross section of a beam that's in bending. So now cutting this beam and exposing the internal stresses here, we know since it's in bending, the top portion of this beam is experiencing compressive stress, right? That's why it's going towards the left, compressing this beam, while on the other hand, the bottom portion of this beam is experiencing 
tensile stress, right? Now, one thing you will notice when it comes to a rectangular cross-section beam such as this, the stress distribution here is going to be essentially like a mirror image, right? The top and the bottom stresses are equivalent, just equal and opposite. One of them is tensile stress while the other one is compressive stress. And right at the center of this, this symmetric cross-sectional area such as a rectangle, this is known as the neutral axis because right at this point along the beam it actually experiences zero um, axial stress. And so now hopefully this um, axial stress that's developed due to the bending of this beam actually starts making a little bit more sense. And so here's actually the equation that you're going to be using to solve for this um, axial stress developed due to bending. So the maximum axial stress is equal to that bending moment. In this case, the bending moment that we have in the shear and moment diagrams, the maximum moment that it experiences times C. In this case, the C is the distance from the neutral axis all the way to the top. This is your C. So you actually are able to calculate the stress distribution along the cross section of this beam divided by the area moment of inertia. And this is dependent, of course, of the geometry of the cross section of the beam, such as having an I beam or a T beam, it would in fact be different. So just keep that in mind. And this is the equation that we're going to be utilizing after we do our shear moment diagrams. We know the maximum moment the beam experiences and therefore we're able to calculate the maximum axial stress that the beam will experience such that we're able to design the beam accordingly so that it won't fail. So now when it comes to the area moment of inertia and finding the neutral axis when it comes to the geometric shape of the cross-sectional area. In this case, we already have the equations when it comes to well-known geometric shapes. So a moment of inertia for this rectangular section is the base times height cubed divided by 12. And of course, the location of the neutral axis, in this case, let's call it y bar is, y bar is equal to the sum of y times a for each individual cross-sectional area. We actually split this cross-section to multiple smaller cross-sections divided by the sum of all the areas gives us y bar. Now I'll go ahead and link these videos when it comes to solving for the moment of inertia as well as so solving for the centroid which I do have in previous videos to be able to solve and find the neutral axis depending on what shape you're dealing with. So I'll go ahead and link them just in case you need a refresher. So let's go ahead and do an example. So for this problem statement, we have the aluminum machine part is subjected to a moment of 75 newton meters. Determine the maximum tensile and compressive bending stresses in the part. So now in this case, you can see all the dimensions given. And in this case, we're dealing with millimeters. And we have this bending moment that this beam is experiencing. Now the cross section of this one, of course, is a little bit more complicated, which will require some more calculations. And we have the neutral axis here drawn. Now when it comes to first solving the neutral axis, because it's going to be important when we utilize um, the bending stress equation, let's go ahead and name this y bar. From the bottom, y bar is this value. And of course, to finding centroids of composite areas such as this one, I'll go ahead and link the video that I previously uploaded in how to solve. So now without going too far into it, we actually end up solving for Y bar being equal to 32.5 millimeters from the bottom here. This is where the location of the neutral axis is located. Now, of course, when you do, when you try to solve for the neutral, the neutral axis or the Y bar, in this case, you sum all the Y's um, with respect to the bottom portion because that's where our reference point is to solve for y bar y1 of this rectangle here right it's 40 by 10 and half of this would be the where the center is located for this geometric shape as well as the area 2 and for this one from the bottom it's going to be 40 plus half of the 10 so it's 45 and this is what you use to go ahead and solve for the y bar divided by the sum of all those smaller areas. So now that we have y bar, we could go ahead and solve for the moment of inertia. Of course, in this case, we're going to be applying the parallel axis theorem because we're going to be solving for the 
moment of inertia of each of these smaller areas but of course it's going to be with respect to the neutral axis which is why we're going to be applying the parallel axis theorem so now using the parallel axis theorem in this case we go ahead and do the moment in this case is the base times height cubed divided by 12 for each individual cross-sectional area right so for one we do the we saw for the moment of inertia Plus, we use the parallel axis theorem, the cross-sectional area of that smaller area, times the distance. So in this case, the distance would be from the centroid of this small area all the way to the neutral axis. And, and since we already have y bar and we have y1, it's easy to solve this d1. And you do the same exact steps for all the other cross sections and finally you end up getting the moment of inertia with respect to the neutral axis being equal to 363.3 times 10 to a negative 9 meters to the fourth and this is another one that we're going to be using now for the actual equation of bending stress in this case let's go ahead and do solve for the stress at the top and we know since it's a bending the top portion is going to be in compression so for the top portion all the way here, we're going to be experiencing compression. So it's equal to the moment times C. In this case, C is going to be from this neutral axis all the way up here to the top of the beam. This is where it's going to be in compression. And of course, since we have Y bar and all the other given dimensions, pretty easy to solve for the C. And let's go ahead and plug in all these numbers. So the top of the beam will be experiencing 3.61 mega pascals now let's go ahead and solve for the bottom portion in this case we know it's in tension and the c would be from the neutral axis all the way to the bottom of the beam which we already which in this case would in fact be y bar 32.5 millimeters so let's go ahead and plug it in and we get 6.71 mega pascals at the bottom or where the beam is experiencing tension so when it comes to these different geometric shapes um that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be that the stress at the top is going to be equivalent to the stress at the bottom of the beam so this is where we went ahead and we actually calculated and solved that the top portion or the beam is being compressed is actually less than where the beam is being in tension of 6.71 megapascals. And these are the stresses we're going to be utilizing to make sure that the material of the beam won't fail given the stresses it will experience, it will experience with the moment. And so it is, in fact, a little bit more steps since you have to solve for the moment of inertia as well as the neutral axis. However, this is something that's very important when it comes to designing beams and be able to come up with the necessary dimensions such that a beam won't fail given any moments um, the beam will experience. So this is how you solve for the bending stress of a beam in bending.